All right. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the last presentation of this series. Tammy, you've got some uh, opening remarks, so the microphone is yours. Thank you. Yes, it's our last class, hard to believe, and I want to thank all of our participants for being so enthusiastic and coming back every week. And um, I hope you have enjoyed the classes. You keep telling me that, so I believe you. Um, just a couple reminders. Um, there are videos of these classes on tampaaudubon.org. You click on programs and then click on OLLI 2021. And um, I was just told that last week's is not uh, posted there yet, um, but it should be. So just keep looking back. Um, Michelle is usually pretty fast at getting those up, but she may have been out of town. Um, I also want to mention that we have a Tampa Audubon um, special meeting coming up on July 14th, and it features Stanley Crow of TECO. He is the Director of Environmental Stewardship, and they do quite a bit for the environment. So um, you're all invited to that. Go to, again, tampaaudubon.org to get the link for that, and that's July 14th at 7 p.m. And I also wanted to mention a really good resource if you've enjoyed this class about birds, a really good resource is on Facebook and that's Hillsborough County Birds. Um, and one of our speakers and the former co-host, Sandy Reed, that many of you know, she's the administrator for that Facebook uh, group. And it just has lots of good information on who see and what where around Hillsborough County. Um, I've ran through these really fast. If anybody has any questions, you can always uh, email me. You have my email address and you can email me anytime if you, you know, six months from now, if you have a question about birding events or um, anything. Oh, birding events. That's another thing I was going to quickly mention that we have a birding and wildlife or nature and wildlife festival um, coming up in the fall in October. And um, I've forgotten that I forgot to look up the dates to those, uh, but go, again, go to tampaaudubon.org and, and you can find more information about it. And then as a final, um, final announcement, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Al Carlson, who has put up with all us non-techie people teaching us how to do Zoom presentations. So everybody give him a thumbs up or applause on your... <laughs> on your little things yeah if you if you know how to do that with your computer we just appreciate Al so much he's so easy to um work with and um doesn't make uh didn't make me feel like an idiot that I feel like I am with with this stuff but anyway Al we appreciate you so much you've made this run very smoothly for us Okay, so that's the end of the commercial. And today we're really in for a treat. Um, we have one of our most popular speakers in this series, Joel Jackson. And you're gonna get a, um, a double dip of his great presentations. He is actually going to um, give you two presentations today um, that I'm sure you're gonna love. And he is gonna take questions um, at the end of each presentation. So he'll stop after the first one, which is gonna be on the history of Lettuce Lake Park. He'll take questions on that one. And then his second presentation is the ecological importance of native plants. And these are always just um, our most popular. He usually does one or the other, but um, we've twisted his arm, I think, and must have to get him to um, work hard this morning. So um, Joel is a lifelong resident of the, of the Tampa area. He went to USF, got his bachelor's and his master's degree there. Um, he was the first park and recreation planner for the city of Tampa and later became Hillsborough County's manager for park planning, design and development. While he was at Hillsborough County, he managed the county's $10 million park bond program to design and develop six nature parks for the county. These include Lettuce Lake Park, Upper Tampa Bay, Edward Medard, E.G. Simmons, and Alderman Ford Parks. 
And um, while he was at the city, he volunteered to write the guidelines for a public vote on bond issues to purchase environmental lands for Hillsborough County. And this is what we now know as the Jan Platt Environmental Lands Acquisition and Protection Program. So we know that is such a, um, an important piece of um, legislation. So we have Joel to thank partly for that. And to date, um, the ELAP program has acquired over 63,000 acres of conservation lands. That's um, something to really be proud of. Um, Joel was awarded the, uh, the Green Palmetto in 2016 by the Florida Native Plant Society for public service. He's a 41 year member of the Florida Native Plant Society. And in 2020, he was awarded the WaterWise Award for Pasco County based on landscapes that promote efficient use of water and Florida friendly landscaping. And that was awarded by uh, the Southwest Florida Water Management District. And last but not least, he is a fantastic leader of our Tampa Audubon Society Photo Club. So if you are interested in photography, when we start having meetings again, please, um, Joel starts the photo club meeting at 6 p.m. and then our regular meeting starts at 7. So with that, Joel, take it away. Okay, uh, I, I start sharing screen. And yes. Um, Yeah, so you'd click on, there we go. Okay, it took a while. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, the hardest part of my presentations are trying to figure out what not to show. Uh, and I, I just, it, it's really hard sometimes trying to condense it down, but I took this picture out of a helicopter. It was the first time I'd ever laid eyes on what became Lettuce Lake Park. And, uh, and this picture was taken roughly the uh, Fletcher Avenue Bridge looking north. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, and, and I, I saw, let's see, where do I go? Uh, where do I advance? Um, you should be able to just click on it and it will advance. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, well. That um, and if that doesn't work, your arrow keys, your right arrow key should advance it. Okay, I'll try that one. Um, no, it doesn't. <clears throat> uh, hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, and, and I don't want to repeat a lot uh, that Tammy just talked about, but basically uh, this is a brochure that was created back in uh, roughly 1977 uh, when I was first hired by the county. Uh, I, I was with the city of Tampa. I was a recreation planner for the city of Tampa and, uh, and they had a bond issue and uh, they needed somebody. And, and because I was there, because I, I had a master's degree and, and they wanted somebody with some background in, in, in management and budgeting and so forth. So anyway, I ended up with the job and I tell you, I was really grateful for that. But uh, we had, at that time, we had what we called Fletcher Avenue Park, which was renamed Lettuce Lake and then Upper Tampa Bay Park um, and uh, E.G. Simmons, uh, Eureka Springs, which is a small park, Edward Medard, which is a Swift Mud property that we leased from Swift Mud out in the, uh, in the Riverview area, and then Alderman's Ford, which is even further south. But I wanted to mention just real quick, Upper Tampa Bay Park, uh, that, that site, and it, it's a coincidence, but that very site was something that the Save Our Bay organization was created in 1969. And I happened to be, in, I had the opportunity to be one of the founders of that organization. Uh, and it, we fought very, very hard to stop a dredge and fill permit by a, an organization that wanted to, to dredge up the entire Upper Tampa Bay 
and turn it into a housing development for 75,000 homes. And it was terrible because it was going to destroy the last acreage of un undeveloped land in, in Tampa Bay. And so we fought it very, very hard and we won. Uh, and, we, and, and as a result, that part of that property, about half of it came to the county. And then I had the opportunity to go back and develop a park on that very same parcel that I had worked so hard to save uh, some years before. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, when we first went to Fletcher Avenue Park, um, I didn't like the name at all. I, I didn't think the name um, was suitable for the name of the street. And uh, so we looked around and we said, well, you know, a lot of cypress stumps here because the park had been developed or at least had been, had been cut but for the cypress trees back in the 20s and 30s. Uh, and, and there were stumps everywhere. Uh, but, you know, I, I realized that over time, a lot of those stumps would decay and, and that name would be kind of lost. So I looked around and I noticed uh, that on the map, it said Lake right here, which is actually a, it, it's, it's actually the river, the river continued north, but eventually it broke new ground over here during a storm or something. But anyway, this is a leftover, what's called the Oxbow Lake. And that is what we call Lettuce Lake Park today. The, uh, the parks that I created, and because of my experience with Save Our Bay, I was so concerned and I had been, I had experienced the fact that most people really did not understand the basic ecology that we have here and why it is so terribly important for them to understand that. So when I, when I started off, this was a newspaper article that goes all the way back to 1979. Um, and I wanted to make sure that people understood that the parks that I was in charge of developing were going to be to emphasize the environment. And, and that's something that I, I struggled through uh, and, and it was not easy. Uh, I had some people that were naysayers. They told me, you know, nobody's going to go to these parks once you get them developed. Um, and, and I even had some of the park people uh, and I hate to say this in a way, but they actually prepared a petition saying that I was making a big mistake here. And uh, anyway, uh, that, that turned out to, to not be the case, fortunately, um, I think. Um, all of the parks were developed with, and I had three basic objectives. And, and the first was to make the parks that we were gonna develop um, enjoyable. Uh, there would be opportunities to go and enjoy nature, uh, to picnic and so forth, just to take it in. Uh, and we hope that that would, of course, help people become more interested in, in the environment. But educational was very important and, and, and stewardship, environmental stewardship was extremely important to me. And I wanted to try to educate people. And the last was to preserve these lands for future generation. I, I felt when we were developing Lettuce Lake and the other parks that the real true value of that park was going to be its enduring value in the years to come. And that was very important to me. Uh, this picture, by the way, was one of the first pictures I ever took of the park. Uh, it was, uh, was only a, a few weeks uh, after I was hired. And uh, you can see the stumps uh, right there. Uh, now, the Lettuce Lake is, and a lot of people don't realize this, I was even surprised that some of the people that worked with Hillsborough County did not fully comprehend this. But the fact is that it is in the middle of a major, and in fact, the largest conservation areas in Hillsborough County. It includes a lot of other properties that are also conservation areas. And we have the Cypress Creek Preserve, we have Eco Palms, which was a requirement for the development of, of North Tampa's uh, uh, um, Tampa Palms. And uh, it was a dedication as a result of all the dredging and filling and so forth they had to do there. And then there's the USF property, which has been in the news lately. And we were just there, I was just there a week ago on a field trip again. Uh, and and that's, that's right here on the corner, which is right near the star as Lettuce Lake Park, obviously. And then we have the upper hills for, or the lower hills for a flood retention area, uh, 
which is actually 1,564 acres, and that belongs to SWIFMA, our water management district. But uh, I was actually involved in some of the reviews for this site, uh, fortunately, and I, uh, I, I consider that a, a, an opportunity. But anyway, I want you to notice that this star, being where Lettuce Lake is, is right in the middle of a lot of stuff, a lot of people. And, and that's important. That's important considerations because my background in part was a planner. And when I started looking at the map, I realized that this park was gonna get a lot of traffic because of its location. And that concerned me. Uh, this that you see right here in the center is or was Lettuce Lake Park. It was not very big. It was only 127 acres. That's not a very big area. Uh, and, and the line, the property line right here goes right through what is now the group picnic area. Just to give you some perspective as to the park, what it was. So I, I went to the, the, the real estate office and I said, look, uh, is there any way that we can buy this additional property here? And basically what they said was, the sellers, which were, they were five doctors, they were, they were speculating and they actually had a brochure to make this a shopping center here. And I said, no, no, this is too important. This is too valuable a land. We can't let that happen. So I, I, but we couldn't get it. I mean, so I went to the Board of County Commission and I, I talked to them. And this is the two different parcels. This is what we had. And this is what we wanted here. And I went to them and I said, look, you know, we really need this. It's important for the development of this park. Uh, we needed this additional 113 acres here. And, uh, and at the time, I, I spiced up my presentation with a lot of pictures of birds and, and flowers and plants and so forth. And they bought it. I mean, they said, okay, we'll, we'll take it. We'll, we'll condemn this parcel and you can take it over. And, and they did. And, and so now the park is 240 acres, which is a much bigger park. And fortunately, uh, it has worked out very well. Um, the dedication, and, and this is the reason I use this here is because I wanna show that the city of Tampa, this, this was the manager for the leisure services in the city of Tampa. This was at the time the city of Tampa's council member, which is Jan Platt. Um, they were part of this. this. This bond issue was not a county bond issue. It was a countywide bond issue, which includes Plant City and the city of Tampa, as well as un unincorporated Hillsborough County. That's very important consideration. Uh, incidentally, uh, these two councilmen, this one and this one, were, were jailed as a result of bribery, but that came later. And that caused me a serious problem later. Uh, we started in 1981 on construction. And you see this sign here. This sign was required for a land and water conservation grant. And we were very fortunate to be able to apply for and get two different land and water conservation grants. And they came with a lot of conditions. We had to do a complete survey of all of the, the Indian uh, per, uh, uh, sites on the site. And we did find several uh, and so forth. It was a very interesting process going through that. But we also got a grant uh, because we were so close to populated areas that we actually got a DOT or a DO, DOI, Department of Interior, uh, land and water, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, DOT grant based on fuel savings. And this was in the 70s uh, because we were so close to populated areas that we were allowed to get people to come shorter distances to the park. And, and this is Fletcher Avenue, what it looked like when it was, uh, when it was being built here. Um, now, one of the things about the park and something that I followed through was that normally streets are straight, okay, and, and urban areas, but I wanted to make sure that all the roads and paths and so forth in the park followed nature. I wanted to make sure that the, the, the nature was the prime thing to keep as much impact as we possibly could. And, and that's why we, we did this sort of thing. I even laid out the sidewalks using rubber hoses 
and and it, again, it, nothing is straight. Uh, and I I would I laid out these sidewalks, uh, and they staked it, and then the next day the crews came in and laid the concrete. Uh, the this is the parking area, which is closest to the boat ramp, uh, the canoe ramp area, and I got one hundred. Uh, well, actually, they're they're called aerial photographs at a very high scale, one inch equals 100 feet. And that's a very, very large aerial photograph. And this was a pine, pine woods here. I went through that and I laid out this parking lot so that we didn't lose any trees. Uh, we uh, worked with the EPC at the time and we, we, got it, we got some consolation for using turf block, which allows for the water to perk into the soil. And I did not like the idea of large retention ponds either. And I thought that was going to be a, a, an eyesore. Um, and so we very carefully, we had some very good engineers and they were able to tilt. That same, this is the same parking lot that I just showed you a couple of slides back. Uh, but this is the side, this right here, if you can look at it carefully here, this is actually the trail, the paved trail that goes around the park. And that's actually a burn or a dike. And the water flows down this way toward this and, and, and it would go into the river normally, but this became our retention pond here. Very gentle, very subtle. You don't notice it as a retention pond, but it's a retention area uh, instead of being a pond. And if you look carefully, this is what it looks like today. Uh, and, and this is really the retention area. And you see the, the path here, the paved path is actually a dike. And it runs around the park. It's 100 feet above sea level. And we kept it at that all the way around. And, uh, and that was something that was very important. This is the visitor center under construction. And now this was designed in the 70s. And in the 70s, everybody sort of become very conscious of, of energy conservation. And these large windows are facing north to get light. This is the classroom area over here and so forth. Uh, and, but I wanted this building to be uh, for environmental education. And I wanted to have a display room over here and a, and a classroom over here. And, and I'll actually work with a school board uh, to help me with the size of the rooms. I wanted them to be able to bring classes here. I have buses and so forth, so we provided uh, the parking space for buses and that sort of thing. Uh, we were very, at the time, now there were no ADA guidelines, but uh, we found a student at the University of South Florida who was working in, in, uh, in uh, architecture. We talked him into trying to do a study on how we could incorporate uh, it, uh, wheelchairs and so forth into the building. And we, so we did, we, we built these ramps uh, so that we had complete accessibility for wheelchairs into the park. And this, again, was before the guidelines. We had plenty of light coming in, natural light. Uh, this is the interior, of the, actually, for the lobby, actually, at the center. Uh, and, and this was the park. And I want to show you, and the reason I show you this picture is because I want to show you the trees. These trees are pine trees. This was built in what's called a pine flatwoods, or simply a pine woods. And it uh, was, that's one of the rarest habitats we have in Florida. And it's a rare habitat for a number of reasons. And one is that it's the highest uh, population for wildlife, for birds. They sit in the tree, they can go to the ground and, and, and feed. Uh, we also have ground feeders because the light, sunlight gets to the ground. Pine trees do not filter a lot of sunlight. So you have a lot of vegetation on the ground. Uh, this is what it looks like now. Big difference. A lot of stuff moved in. And this is called secession uh, geologically. Secession is when you have trees that move in and crowd out the pine trees. Now what this does is it makes the habitat, the area, less suitable uh, for wildlife. And, and that's unfortunate. But there are a number of reasons why it's happening. And I've, I've tried to get, we, there's been a lack of control burns there over the years. And that's for a number of different reasons. But I'm still fighting that issue to try to encourage them to do that. 
the restroom buildings, and this may sound funny, but I've always been very interested because they're traditionally uh, dens of dark dampness, and I don't like that idea. I wanted them to be friendly, open, airy, and so you you see if this building has actually got large openings all the way around. It's got ducts uh, on the sides, uh, vents on the sides here, and it's a it's a nice, airy, bright uh, restroom building, and that's what I wanted. Very important. I, I wanted people to feel comfortable going there. Now, this is when we were laying out the boardwalk, and this is Rob Heath right here. He was, I hired him, actually I hired him at an Audubon meeting, and he was, had been the president of Tampa Audubon for a while, and I was really impressed with how knowledgeable he was, and I hired him. He was working actually at the time for the Florida Park Service, and I convinced him to come to work for me, and, and, and this is me over here, uh, on the left uh, with our rubber boots on. We walked that entire route of the boardwalk five times. Um, and it was it was not easy. I mean, we fell in at least a couple of times. Uh, we'd fill our boots with water. Uh, it, was, it was tough, but the guy in the background was a surveyor and he was surveying as we go to make sure that we were getting the, the, the length of the boardwalk as we laid it out because that was important for bidding it out for construction. But when I first went there and I experienced this area, I was, I, I just, I felt like if I did anything here, I wanted to make sure that the public had an opportunity to get inside and, and, and see a real honest to goodness wetland and what it looks like with all of the rich environmental things it has to offer. And, uh, and that was very, very important to me. And uh, uh, I went down to the corkscrew swamp and I saw their boardwalk down there and I came back convinced that this is what we have to do. So being, you know, I had, I had the budgets, so I made sure that in the budget I had enough money to, to build this boardwalk. Uh, and we tried very hard to build it durable, which, be, and I, the last thing in the world I wanted was to go off like I did uh, and years later and then have them complain to me, well, you know, we had to go back and repair this and replace that and so forth. And it was built, you know, poorly. I didn't want to have that happen. So I, I tried to make it things strong. These posts are a little bit oversized and granted uh, and everything was heavy duty. And, and that was important to me because it was, I wanted it to be there for a long time. And of course it's been there a, a long time now, I don't know, like uh, 37 years or something. Um, and we worked that boardwalk back and forth into various habitats uh, and, and to try to allow people the opportunity. Now this gets a railing later on, but the boards are put down first. Um, one of the things that, that I really uh, thought a lot about, and this is another parking lot over uh, just north of the visitor center. Uh, I wanted people to be able to come to a park like this and not have to walk a country mile to get to the picnic shelters or the picnic area. So, and this is the trail in the foreground, the paved trail, and, and these are cars parked. And again, I, I used those aerial photographs and I laid out that parking lot. It looks kind of funny when you go there and you see a little patchy here, patchy there. But the fact was that that parking lot was laid out without destroying any, any meaningful trees. And uh, so, we have that, and then uh, we put the picnic shelters back in a way that they're not seen or, or you don't sense them from the parking lot, or you don't see the parking lot when you're at the picnic shelter. And this was intentional. You notice that the, the posts I use, I actually try to, to stain them to match the trees around and so forth. I, and I actually had a big, a big debate with the architect who at the time was a member of, he was a chairman of the, the uh, Hillsborough County Planning Commission uh, and he had some weight around here. But anyway, he wanted to make these shelters uh, very, very beautiful with all kinds of, of, of ornamentation and the post going through the roof like a tiki hut or something. And I argued with him, no, 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 I want that shelter to blend in. I want it to disappear. And so that's what I, and you know, I, I was able to prevail. 
So that's what we got. Now, this is actually the observation tower under construction. And we had to float in these big logs and they're actually 70 feet long. Uh, they look like big telephone poles. Um, and we floated them in from the Fletcher Avenue bridge. Uh, the only way we could get them in there because there was no, I mean, there's no road to this area here where the, show, where the, where the, uh, the, the uh, tower is. Um, and this is the tower under construction, the posts are, are in. Now it's important to understand too that I had to get a company to bring a barge in and do some soil borings in order to know exactly how deep to penetrate those poles. And it turns out that we had to go through the five feet of muck, which was here, and then 13 feet of sand in order to provide stability to the shelter. And, uh, and so this is how it progressed. Now, one of the things often overlooked with parks is a good maintenance program. So I made sure that we built this maintenance building. Uh, it's a nice big maintenance building with a lot of nice things. It's got skylights and so forth to help. And, uh, and we actually provided some housing there for the park manager, which was nice because they can stay on the site. And then uh, you see that this, the building is right back here, but we actually uh, put the maintenance area on a little curved road and the picture, I took this picture from the middle of the entrance road, but you don't notice it because it's camouflage and the curved road blocks the view. Uh, and, and that was important to me. Um, the other things were that the roads themselves, the actual paving, I used what was called soil cement. Now, soil cement is a little bit more expensive, but it makes the road a whole lot more durable. And that was important because I didn't want five, 10, 15 years down the road for the road to start cracking up and looking bad. So uh, we used the soil cement and that, that I think worked out well. Uh, and, and we added this, this concrete curb here along the edge because uh, I know that a lot of times, you know, you have a road and it's asphalt and then you start having the edges crumble and it looks terrible. And I wanted these concrete curbs to be flush unobtrusive at the same time, they, they really keep the edge of the road from crumbling away and looking bad. And, and that's what we did. Here again, when you enter the park, and this is a very important thing, when you enter the park, and this is a telephoto image now, but the road waves around and, and that's intentional. Uh, we wanted people to feel like when they entered a park, nature was in charge, not the road. And I wanted them to slow down uh, and, and not go so fast. And, and that's why the entry road looks the way it does. And it weaves around a lot. And, uh, and by the way, I, uh, the, the day before we were coming in with the, ma the machinery to take out all of this here, I found a little oak tree and I took it home and planted it in my yard and it turned out to be a beautiful tree. But anyway, um, I provided parking for the buses and, and that was important for, you know, school groups and so forth. But the thing was that I provided parking. Now, at the time, I actually had people within the department complain to me. And I mean, this was, I got a lot of complaints. I mean, they said, you're building a park, not parking lots. Why are you wasting money on parking spaces? Well, the fact is that if you don't build a designated parking area, then the cars are gonna be all over the place. And that's bad for visitors, for children. Uh, if they tear up the soil and so forth. I want, the, I want the park to be important. I want it to be almost sacred ground. I don't want cars all over. So I, I made, uh, and I, I tried to make sure that we had signs and so forth that said parking in designated areas. Now, there are times when they, they do go over a little bit, but I think that's unavoidable. Um, the trail, and, and we put in this trail, keep in mind, this was the original boundary of the park right here, okay? But we, th this was a little cypress dome that I, was, I wanted very much to get a, a trail into. I think it's a very important place and I wanna talk more about that later. 
but the trail actually was my way of tying the park together so that people could not only use it for exercise and so forth, but that they could actually see it, uh, different parts. Plus, it provided a way for the maintenance vehicles to get from place to place without having to cut across the grass. And, uh, and, and that was important. Um, so it became what I call a multi-purpose and it served bicycles and skateboards, uh, pedestrians and nature walking and, and fitness and also maintenance trucks. And I, uh, and I, and I actually I bought some of these things when I was there to make sure that they got the, they weren't using big, big trucks. Now there is a spot that some people sometimes ask me about. There's this pattern of texture that's into the concrete here and the stripes here. This is where bicycles or, or skateboarders and roller skaters would be traveling. And I did not want to create a conflict. So when they hit this paving, they know they're on something. It, it vibrates the, the wheels and therefore they know to stop or they're be cautious that they're encroaching a vehicular traveled road. Now the play area was into a shady area. And this is important too, because we provided benches and so forth. And, I, and while I was with the city of Tampa, I remember we got a lawsuit because a child got hurt on playground equipment. And the problem was that her parents were nowhere around. So what I wanted to do here was that I put the seating and so forth, the shady seating uh, near the play equipment so that the parents could sit and watch their children and encourage them to supervise their children. And, and this is important. This is not something that just happened that way. Um, and there are a couple of other things that, that just made look odd, but they were there for a reason. And we were concerned about, this is an open play field here, and we were concerned about balls that might roll out into the road. And I did not want to use a chain link fence here or something. So what we did was we burned up this area ever so slightly so that when balls do roll, they don't tend to roll directly. I mean, they will, they can, but they don't tend to roll directly into the road. Uh, and it also provides a seating area for people to sit and look at people playing. Uh, and they can even uh, just sit and relax on Sunday if they want to. But the idea was, uh, was there and, and it is subtle. Okay, but it's there for a reason. Now, this is that Cypress Dome that I talked about. And when I found it, I was just absolutely thrilled. Uh, it is a different type of an area. Now, we have the boardwalk area, the main boardwalk area, which is in a wetland of the river or the Cypress or the Cypress Creek uh, or Lettuce Lake. Uh, that's a riverine system. And the riverine system has a different ecology. It has a, 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 a fall, a rise and fall and so forth. Cypress Dome don't do that nearly as much, only by the rainfall. But as you go into it, uh, you find a lot of very interesting plants, a lot of mosses, a lot of ferns. Uh, and there's even what we call bladder, floating bladderwort here, which is actually a carnivorous plant. And it it actually catches insects in pockets, little bubbles like things on its <clears throat> roots here and it digests them. And, and this is an example of a plant that grows in an area <clears throat> that it doesn't get a lot of nutrients from the soil. So they've adapted themselves to catching insects. And that's why we call them carnivorous plants. Uh, the, 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 building, the main building, the, the classroom building, uh, we re-landscaped, we re-landscaped, I only used landscaping that was adopted, that occurred naturally in the park. And, uh, and, and that way we demonstrated the fact that, that it was an eco cleanly a landscaping that supported our native wildlife. And, and that was very, very important to me. Now at the time I had intentions to build a picnic, I mean, I'm sorry, a canoe launch, but USF had one right across the river and it was open to the public. And I thought, well, why waste money on that? So we didn't, and then USF closed it, their, their property. So, and it's still closed today. So 
That's why the county had to come back later and provide a canoe rental, which is a good thing. This picture or, or newspaper article was done a week or so before the park opened. And I, th th I was showing uh, this cypress stump. This cypress stump, it was a stump, was so big that I could walk in and reach my arms out and not touch the sides. And after a year or two, it completely collapsed, which I felt bad about. But the idea here that I want to get across is that I wanted to stress environmental, the environmental nature of the park, very important. And, and that's why I warned people that when they came here, it was going to be an environmental park. Uh, this is a picture I took. I had this sign made. Uh, this was uh, when we first opened the park. And we opened it in October of 1982. And I, I had, again, going back, I, I was warned uh, that nobody is going to come to this park. You know, you're wasting your money, you're wasting your time. And um, so it was, we opened it on a Saturday. And Sunday morning, I got a phone call from the people at the gate. And they said, we have too many cars here. What do we do? So I went back and I added 20 more parking spaces in the back there uh, near the group picnic area. Um, and now this park is the most visited park in Hillsborough County. Um, so I felt so relieved that things worked out. And since then, it's become the most visited park in the county. And uh, here we have Tammy and, and Anne and so forth. Uh, they, they give regular tours here uh, on bird watching. And I've, I've taken it and it's very good. Uh, and I also included this. Now keep in mind, this presentation was not prepared uh, to share necessarily with Native Plant Organization, Audubon. It was prepared primarily for Hillsborough County. They asked me to put it together. And the reason was is because the park has become so popular, one of the top 10 destination spots in Hillsborough County, so popular that they wanted to try to understand what we did and how we did it. And, and so that's why I put it together. And then I happened to show it to somebody and they said, oh, that's really neat, why don't you show it? So, okay, so it's here. And, uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, I was giving one of these presentations and this, this was in 19 or 2011. Now this was like second or third year that I'd given one of these presentations for Audubon. And uh, these two ladies here were with the, they were master gardeners and they said, uh, and, and, and since I had been away, keep in mind that I was retired and, and the park had fallen into a situation where people were bringing their own plants from home and planting them and so forth. And said a lot of the stuff here is not native. And why don't you just go ahead and, and re landscape? And I said, Well, I don't have any help. It's hard to do. So these ladies offered to help and, and they came, and, and I was so grateful for that. So we redid. We redid the front of the building. And then uh, Anne and Paul asked me to do the back. And, and that was a lot of work. And they actually gave me a budget. And I got a budget uh, that the Native Plant Society gave some money, and, the, and Audubon gave some money, and actually, the Coke fund for the park gave me a couple hundred bucks and, and we had a work day there. These are mostly uh, Tampa, our native plant, Hillsborough County Native Plant Society members. And, uh, and so I had this sign made and it's sponsored by Tampa Audubon Society, Suncoast Native Plant Society, and Hillsborough County and the Coke fund. <laughs> but you see, you see it here, this was the initial uh, planting. It was one mistake, you, know, you see the curved road there, a path, that was my doings again. But the problem we ran into, and I didn't realize at the time was that the, the shade, the sun, because this is the north side of the building, a lot of this stuff needed more sun. And we had to go back and make some adjustments to it. But while I was there, I, I, I said, you know, I wanna put out signs so people can understand what some of these plants are. And I can't be there all the time. And even some of the park rangers that worked there didn't know what they were. So I made up these signs. I put them out. I put out 35 signs. Uh, and I was really surprised when I did that as I'm putting them out on a Sunday afternoon, they had these people coming and looking at my signs. 
And, and then after a couple of weeks, uh, it rained and all of the paper I used, which said on the label, it was waterproof and it really wasn't. It all curled up, it fell off the sides. I said, wow, that was a lot of work. I'm not sure I wanna do that again. But then I started getting phone calls and emails and people saying, you got to do it again. Well, we came back and did it again. This time I used a much, much more durable material. And, uh, and these are some of the signs we, we, and actually we went across the road there, the paved path to try to demonstrate some of the things were already there. And I thought that would be a reasonable thing to do. But Tampa Audubon has its volunteers uh, doing, uh, this, is, this is Roger, uh, sheets uh, and he gives regular tours there and, and so forth. Uh, we have native, we do a native plant walk, which I'm going to change the name to, to nature walk. Um, and we do that normally uh, during the cooler times of the year, November, I mean, I'm sorry, October to June. And <clears throat> we do it Saturday mornings at nine normal. We're, we're not doing it right now because they shut us down for coronavirus. But anyway, uh, we had groups that would come and we would uh, show them around and uh, they seemed to enjoy themselves and I hope they got some, some, they learned some things. But part of the problem that I'm really upset about and have been for a while is that we have a lot of non-native stuff moving in and it's been a very difficult dif uh, situation. Um, we have recruited people to come in and help. This is Heartline, they came in for a day and I see this as an opportunity to help because I always give them a presentation of why what they're doing is important, getting rid of all these non-native things. And we talk about the park and then they contribute by helping us pull weeds and so forth. Caesar weed is a real problem there. And it's a terrible, terrible weed. Um, the University of Tampa Ecology Club, I came there and gave a couple of talks and they came out and they actually collected a lot of stuff, which was really important because you can't just pull these things. They got seeds on the camp, they, you gotta get rid of them. Uh, Johnson & Johnson was there and they helped, they did a great job. Uh, and, and this is my next presentation, which has to do with the importance of native plants. So I'm gonna stop right here. Uh, and uh, Tammy, if you have any questions, I'm here. Okay, well, nobody has put any questions in that I see. Um, but I did share with Joel one of the questions I remembered from the when we were out at Lettuce Lake Park last week. Um, someone had asked me if there were many um, exotics or nuisance species at the park when it was developed. So I'm going to let Joel answer that for everybody. Uh, there were some things like water lettuce, which is a, a non-native, and uh, Water spangles, which is a fern that floats on the water. Some people call it duckweed, but it really isn't. And uh, and then there is, there was uh, the um, well, there there were some aquatic weeds. But anyway, um, not not much other than that, those things. And uh, and but I was really surprised, and I I'm, I'm not sure how it came in. I suspect that maybe walking pets may have brought in some seeds. Uh, and along the trail, and we get especially, there's a lot of stuff, especially behind the visitor center, that I, I just, it breaks my heart to go there and see it. So we, that's one reason we get groups to come in. I'll be there tomorrow uh, with a group, uh, 15 people, and, and uh, helping us pull weeds. I mean, I'll be 70 years, I'm, I'm 79 years old now, and it's hard for me, but I really want to encourage people to help. And I've tried to get the, con the county to help. Um, but they have a lot to cover and, and they're, they're, they're not at the moment, not that active in helping us. So we, we keep on struggling with it. Thank you, Joel. We have, um, we do have um, a couple questions that have come through, but I just want to say, aren't we glad of Joel's vision that he was so forethinking that he thought about all these things that we now enjoy, like parking and um, having the, picnic areas blend in that are that's great for birding of course um so our first question is from uh mary wilson uh you mentioned that usf has been in the news about their property what issue is that well it's a long story in a way but i'm a, a member of the elap subcommittee uh and we had a big conversation about this and, it, and the elap program 
when I wrote the guidelines, I made darn sure that uh, there were some very stringent guidelines there. And, uh, and, and one is that once it is declared uh, a, by the ELAP, once it's purchased, uh, then it has a covenant that goes into the deed and that property can't be used for anything else but conservation. And it has to have a management plan, meaning every few years it has to be uh, reviewed and, and, and updated and so forth and that non-native vegetation be routinely controlled and so forth. These are all very important. This property does not have any of that. The property itself is owned already by the state and, and the state is the one that actually matches a lot of our ELAP money, but it, it is not an ELAP site. I don't know of any way to deal with that except to try to get the state to adopt some guidelines for that property and say that it follows them. If they want to follow the same guidelines we use for ELAP, fine, but there's no purpose in ELAP buying the land it already owned by the state, um, much the same way the Bower Track in the Upper Tampa Bay is owned by the state. And actually, so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, so I'm not sure where we're going to go with this. I really don't know or think that USF is going to pursue, continually pursue. There's a lot of land there and there's some very good land and there's some scrub lands and some uh, uh, pine flatwoods that are ideal for home building and office building and all that, but that's not what that property should be used for. And I think we all agree to that. Okay, yeah, that is a um, hot issue right now. Oh, from Stephen, he says, um, uh, encroachment, I am startled every time I see the big gray building just past the east boundary of the park. This is seen from the paved loop east of the Cypress Dome boardwalk. How will development threaten on the west side of the river? Well, you know, that's important. And the fact is that uh, when I was buying, I bought a lot of land uh, when I, I was managing the bond program. And, and there were lands that I wanted to buy and I didn't have enough money. Uh, and, and so that was one reason why I was so motivated to write the guidelines for uh, the ELAP program in order to have more money through a bond issue. And, and that's what we did. But once the land is not owned by us, the county, um, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's gone. It's no longer available to us. And, and that's unfortunate. Every time I looked over there, I felt bad. I, I tried really hard. We fought the issue, we fought the battle. We won a certain part of it but I can't go forever. And so there's always going to be a part of it that is, is privately owned. And, and that is something that I've stressed over and over again. I remember when I was writing the guidelines for the ELAP program, I was just so, uh, so intent on making sure that we were going to try to buy whatever we could before it became developed and lost forever. And, and this is an example here of what we have if we don't do more of, of conservation land. And I know that some people say, oh, well, 63,000 acres, that's a lot of land. Well, normally you want one third of your land mass to be in conservation, a minimum of one third. And that's one of the things we strive toward. Okay, great. Um, Sandy Reed asked, I think you've already answered this question. Um, what do you think of the plan to sell off the USF property? Is there any chance of saving the land? So you said that the land is already owned by the state. Right. So by the state, but it's needed, or at least given to to USF to manage. And and the fact is that they're doing a very poor job of it. Uh, they 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 have not. They don't have a management plan there. They have not done anything as far as maintenance of the property. They, at one time, they actually were managing it some probably 15 years ago. I worked with Dr. Wonderland, who is one of the renowned uh, professors there uh, at the time. And uh, he, he was very important. They had fires, they had burns there and so forth. They're not doing any of that anymore. They kind of just let it go by the way. And, and that's a tragedy. Uh, so there needs to be encouragement to the university. To convert. They have the power, they have the ability but they're not, they're not exercised right now. Well, I think the, there's been quite a bit of 
public outcry. So maybe that will help them. That will help, definitely. Okay. Um, so from Barbara, she asks, uh, can you list the current names of other area parks? I love Lettuce Lake and I want to explore other areas. So um, I listed those um, in Joel's uh, intro, the parks that he had worked on. Um, I'll let him go ahead and, and talk again about them. Well, Hillsborough County uh, actually has maps uh, and in fact, very good process of showing all the different uh, conservation parks and they're classified. Uh, you can also, uh, they have the ELAP sites uh, as well as the ones that are like, for example, Upper Tampa Bay is not an ELAP site. And I had a big discussion with them at one of our meetings and I said, look, it may not be an, a, an ELAP site, Upper Tampa Bay, or Lettuce Lake for that matter as well. They may not be ELAP sites but they're still conservation land and they all ought to be treated equally. And because the ELAP sites, they have money for maintenance better than the, the parks have for Lettuce Lake and Upper Tampa Bay and so forth. And, and I'm still trying to convince them of that. I hope none of them are watching at the moment. I mean, I, I make it for myself a nuisance enough already, but anyway, uh, and that's important to me because these are conservation lands, no matter how the funding came about. And, and that's where I brought my approach when I, when I speak out of the meetings. Okay, and I, I just add that um, Upper Tampa Bay Park, um, if you're on kind of the east side of Hillsborough County, you may, may not be as familiar, but it's kind of at the northwest of the bay there. It's almost to Oldsmar along State Road 580 or Hillsborough Avenue. And then um, other parks that Joel was involved in was E.G. Simmons in um, just south of Apollo Beach. I guess that's uh, Ruskin and um, Lithia Springs, Medard and Alderman Ford. Is that all of them, Joel? Yeah, yeah. And since then, there have been a lot of others that have been added. Uh, most of them are not developed. A lot of the ELAP sites are really not developed, except for maybe minimal parking. Uh, normally, restroom facilities are not included normally, um, but they do have trails, and I've hiked an awful lot of them. There are some very good places to go, and some of them are very close in, but there are too many at the moment to talk about. There is a map available. Um, and I downloaded it. I, I don't have it on the computer at the moment. It would be difficult for me to pull it up, I think. But it does show all the different uh, sites. And, and then if you go into the website there, they have the, the, the County Conservation Department. And one of the nice things about it, it used to be Hillsborough County Parks and Recreation. Now it's Hillsborough County Parks and Recreation and a separate department for conservation lands. And that's very important. I think I was thrilled when that happened. So that gave us an opportunity to concentrate our efforts on just conservation areas. And they do have a lot of good information there and they work very hard, some very fine people there. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled with working with them. Great. So Patricia Hayes um, comments that Joel did a wonderful job at Lettuce Lake. It's a very special place. And uh, Sandy Reed um, wants to know who to rec who do you recommend, Joel, that we write to on the state level about the USF property? So would that be to USF or someone else at the state? No, I think it needs to go to USF and it needs to go to the, uh, the president's office. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, that uh, concludes um, the first presentation. So um, maybe I'll let uh, Joel get ready for his next one. And if anybody needs to get up and stretch for a couple of minutes or get another glass of water or something, we'll give uh, Joel just a couple of minutes to uh, get ready for the second one. He's on a marathon here with presentations. Yeah, we can do that. Thank you. I'll be back in about four minutes. Okay, great. Well, we're so happy. Um, I know everyone is that Joel, I just am um, always amazed at the foresight that he had. Um, 
in planning these parks, um, especially Lettuce Lake, the things that he thought of to, you know, to curve the roads and to try to make it as natural as possible. And, and as I alluded to um, earlier, uh, that just allows for great birding when you don't have huge buildings that are bright and picnic areas that are clear cut around them. Um, often, you know, I go there to the little picnic tables to bird because they are so close to the wetland there. Um, anyway, we appreciate that so much. And um, if anybody else has any other comments while we're just waiting a few minutes, please give them in. We uh, appreciate all your positive comments about our class. We like to hear that. So um, we, Ann and I and Sandy, we're trying to remember how long this class has been going on. and. Uh, we're not even sure, but we think it's uh, 17, 18 years, getting close to 20 years or something, and um, everyone still seems to enjoy it. So we are very happy about that. And each year we do try to try to um, change up the roster of speakers a little bit um, for variation, but we have some like Joel who, who are just so popular. I don't think anyone ever gets tired of hearing them. Sandy Reed, are you still on? I'm trying to look to see if you're um, muted or what I was wondering if you had another question about that Sandy is still there she's muted she may have taken advantage of uh, Joel's yeah, offer the to break. step away for a moment <laughs> yeah I know um, I know Tampa Audubon wrote um, a letter to the editor about the um, USF's um, idea to sell that uh, property to, to developers. And um, we are, you know, of course, keeping a, an eye on what happens with that. Uh, you've got a comment from Mary here. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I had turned off chat and it popped up again. So um, <laughs> it just, I think it just came up. Um, we'll let Joel get, um, get, uh, back to his station there before we hit him. That, makes, like, that seems fair. It's changing here. I'm trying to adjust for it. Okay. All right. We had another, um, another question or comment pop up about parks and then um, we'll go get started with the new, with the new topic. But uh, Mary Wilson uh, says, I don't know if Joel is familiar with Picnic Island Park. It was so disappointing to see the city has put riprap along much of the beach rather than doing beach renourishment. Yeah, you have to keep in mind, uh, I was with the city of Tampa for 17 years and uh, a good portion of that period, I was among other things, the manager for a lot of stuff there at the city. Uh, one was a tree and landscape ordinance. One was the uh, forestry section. And, and one was parks and, and Picnic Island was one of my parks. And I did a lot of, of things there, um, but Picnic Island is basically, it, it was at one time three separate spoil islands and it was combined together and then given to the city of Tampa for, they, when they dredged the uh, canal coming into the port. But uh, it is a very difficult area to work with uh, and partly because it's all mostly limestone and and clay and so forth. It's very hard to grow anything there, but um, it it is where it is is not a natural place. And erosion has always been a serious problem there. And I had aerial photographs going back, and you could see. I mean, I'm talking about losing like 100 and maybe 150 feet of the park constantly. And and I didn't put riprap there. I mean, I tried all kinds of things, but I can understand why they would want to do that. Uh, because it is difficult. They're losing a lot of ground there. And, uh, and that's something that, you know, the public would like to see stopped. So anyway, uh, I try not to, to cast too many stones in, in other people's direction. 
but uh, that's my take on it. Tree nourishment is um, very expensive, and um, I don't think they would want to spend those funds, uh, like Joel said, on an area that isn't naturally a beach. So um, with that, we will um, get started as soon as Joel is ready on ready. the importance of native plants. All right, take it away. This is a topic that's very dear to me. Uh, and. Uh, this, by the way, this flower uh, is, is a picture I took uh, uh, in my yard. And it, it's actually, this, is, this, this flower is actually called the uh, climbing aster. It tends to be slightly bluish color. And, uh, and this is a sweat bee. This is a native bee. And there are about 316 different native bees. Honey bees are not native, okay? So that's, that's important to keep in mind. Um, but I've had people tell me, oh, I've seen your presentation before. Yeah, I know, but I try to change each one a little bit. So brace yourself here. Uh, and, and I'm saying these are, these are things I've already said. You know, they're very important, uh, critical to native plants or the wildlife. Um, uh, the fact is that native wildlife wants native plants and there's a relationship there. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And, um, and the other is that I think there have been a number of studies uh, by either uh, Audubon Society or National Geographic that have actually documented through university studies as well, the difference that a non-native plant will attract at, uh, wildlife as versus a native plant. And, there, and it, of course, it varies from plant to plant. Um, but the fact is that most people, and this is what's really striking to me, because I give a lot of talks to garden clubs. And the reason I spend the time to go to these garden clubs is because I want to get the word out. It's very important to me. I need, we need to educate the public on how important that is. If they value, I used to go to garden clubs and I'd say, I'm here talking about native plants, and I could see everybody's eyes just kind of glazing over, and they would, you know, oh my. But I don't do that anymore. When I go to a, cl a club, one of the things I first started off with was, hey, you guys like bees and butterflies? Oh, yeah, yeah, we like birds. We like butterflies. Oh, yeah, we like that. We like that. I said, okay, well, in order to do that, let's talk about native plants. And that made, that was my door to get in, okay? And so all plants have a lot of things in common. They have green leaves, they have roots, they have, you know, so forth. But, but a lot of them are not adapted to here in Florida. We have a different type of soil in most places. Um, a lot of native, uh, uh, non-native plants can be highly invasive because they're brought here without their, their in, the insects that keep them in check wherever they came from. And very often uh, they require pesticides. If you look at some brochures, they say, oh, this plant, you know, it could be anything, but it's a non-native. Oh, well, you know, it, it does fairly well as far as insects are concerned, but you still have to spray it now and then. Well, why worry about the insects? Insects can be good. They can be food for wildlife. And that's an important consideration. Um, and, um, you know, there have been studies that said, you know, that, that some uh, trees uh, have 270 times more wildlife attracted than native trees. And, and that's important. Um, and, and I have this sign in my yard. And I, by the way, I took liberties to include uh, a lot of things. And from here on, it's a lot about my yard. And, and the reason was, is because I got to thinking about it. And really, uh, I think my yard demonstrates a couple of things about, about native plants. And one is that I can go out anytime, walk around the yard and really enjoy it. I can see things, I can see birds, I can see butterflies, I can see bees that I enjoy. And, and that, to me, is very exciting. My yard has become a very interesting and exciting place to me. But anyway, I like this sign, and I, I put it in my, my front yard. Uh, native plants bring life, and that's so important. Um, traditionally, landscaping was beautification. You go and you buy stuff, looks good, fine, stick it in. But you know, over the years, a lot of this stuff has been carried to the point where a lot of these plants don't even have sexual uh, parts to them and, and, and don't reproduce. They don't provide nectar or anything. Uh, they don't provide food. Uh, 
and and really they're very in many ways just uh, very sterile almost like you could use plastic plants um, but north america has lost a lot of birds in in 50 years uh 29 for example of warblers and uh it's just an, an example. And the main reason is, is because of loss of natural habitats, very important. And I, I got this, this photo actually from Sandy, um, but 50 years ago, borrowing owls uh, were, were a lot of them in Hillsborough County. I remember as a high school kid seeing burrowing owls here in Hillsborough County, and I haven't seen one since. And, and now you don't, you just can't find a park. Uh, she had a, this picture was taken down in uh, uh, in South, uh, I guess, but uh, somewhere in uh, Naples or something. But and and again, uh, you know, we talk about bees. There are 316 species of native bees, bees, uh, and yet they've been declined 40 to 50 percent in the past 10 years. This is a native. This is a bumblebee. This is in my yard, um, and it's one of the 316. 90% of the North American monarch butterflies have been lost. And I got this figure just a couple of weeks ago. It is now said, it keeps changing, but now it is considered to be 90% in 20 years. Now, I took this picture on my front porch, uh, which is open, of course. Uh, this is a chrysalid and the butterfly is spreading its wings for the first time, inflating its wings. Um, but to understand what's going on here in Florida, it's under, you need to understand the history of Florida. And some time ago, uh, some thousands of years ago, uh, its sea level was 60 feet higher than it is today. And, and that means that Florida was mostly underwater. It was a series of seven islands. And those islands were very isolated for a very long time. And, uh, and the species of plants that we had and the wildlife became very close to each other. They depended on each other. They provided each other for food and so forth. Florida has over 2000 different endemic species. And that means endemic means it's not found in other places of the world. Very important to, to keep in mind. Um, the, uh, the ecosystem, again, this is a yopon, which is one of my favorite trees. Uh, and they're very, they're very dependent on that. This is a neighbor uh, who lives just across the pond from me. But if you look at the yard, I mean, it looks beautiful and so forth. But the problem is that it has very few, if any, native vegetation. And it is typical of how people really don't understand. And I'm not saying that we're bad people. They just don't understand it, um, why it's important. But it is this popularity of non-native vegetation that has been considered to be the single biggest problem for the lack of native vegetation is that non-native vegetation has become so popular. Now, on the left here, we have the cabbage palm, which is the official state tree. Some argue that it's not a tree because it's grass, but technically to me, it's a tree. Uh, and it has the sable palmetto, which is the Latin for it, com the common name is cabbage palm. And then we have over here, a Mexican, which people always refer to as the Washingtonia. And the Washingtonia has become very popular and I, the, the problem I'm having at the moment is that, um, that I, uh, I've got a screen here that's blocking my view. Let me see if I can go back. Okay. The, the Washingtonia has become very popular because it grows fast and nurserymen can grow them very quickly. And in fact, the Latin for it is, uh, it is actually robusto, meaning it grows quickly uh, and, and it gets completely out of sight. It just grows up and you know, it grows a 70 feet real quick. Uh, whereas the cabbage palm, when you see one in the back here, is very uh, slow growing com relatively compared. And, and that's a good thing in many ways. 
but this is the sable here. Whoops, let me go back again. Um, this is a sable here, and I wish I could get rid of that. I don't know if maybe you're not seeing it here. Um, get rid of it, okay. Um, this sable, you see all these little, these are seed pods, and you, you don't see any seeds on them. And where do those seeds go? They went into birds. Um, and in fact, you can stand under one of these trees when it has seeds, and you can hear this racket going off up in the tree with all the birds up there just gorging on the berries. And these are the berries right here from this tree. They're bird size, Florida bird size. This has a, this is a berry to this tree, this particular one, very similar to the, to the Washingtonia, almost, you know, in many ways, very close. But this is from the queen palm which is actually from Brazil. We do not have parrots here. Uh, and the seeds are far too bigger, uh, too big to, to, for our birds to eat. Another problem we have, and I, you know, it breaks my heart when I see this, is that license to kill. You know, I have a neighbor. I have a neighbor that has the same St. Augustine grass I have. She has a lawn service that comes by regularly and kills everything, everything. And what she doesn't understand is that those critters inside the soil are actually providing nutrients by breaking down organic materials and providing nutrients that the plants really need. And by going through and killing everything, you destroy that. And then the grass becomes much more susceptible to chinch bugs and other critters. And then you have to call these people back again. And it's a vicious circle. You need to be able to do it. You know, some years ago, I remember when somebody said, you know, you don't have to spray to kill everything. I thought to myself, oh no, I, maybe I should just get a different grass. But what I learned was that my lawn has not had, to my knowledge, and I've been here nine years, to my knowledge, ever been sprayed to kill everything or to use pesticides to kill everything. And that's really important. Um, the critters that grow around um, are, are very important to wildlife. Uh, and again, this is in my backyard. Um, 96%, and this is from the Audubon Society now, 96% uh, of land birds rely on insects to feed their chicks. I have bird feeders. I've made 69 bird feeders, bluebirds, I mean, blue, uh, nesting boxes for bluebirds. And, uh, and, and the thing is that uh, I'm thrilled when I set these things out and give them away. I give them away, don't, and I never charge for one. Uh, people call me back and they say, wow, after three days, I got bluebirds. And that's wonderful, uh, but they rely on, and I can see them out there. I took this picture right, in fact, this post, this is the top of the post, and there's a nesting box just below that with chicks in it, and they come there, and they, they look around, and they show off their, their insects, and, and worms, and, and worms are especially good because chicks can eat worms with no problem, and they like those, and they're soft, whereas bugs sometimes can be a little bit more difficult for the chicks to eat. Um, like this one, this is a, a bug here, but um, this one was in, in one of the nesting boxes that I have here in the yard, uh, and, and these are the eggs, and this is what you get after they hatch. Now, some plants, and it's part of the problem we just talked about, uh, form what we call a monoculture. They cover over everything. Look how it's covering over the salt palmetto here and they crowd out everything and they do not provide anything beneficial as far as our wildlife is concerned. Um, the problem is they were brought in, into this country uh, by nurseries and they didn't bring the bugs with them. Now what they've done since then and this is done this picture was taken just a short time ago a couple of years ago uh, they brought in this bug now which is eating it but it's 
a very uphill battle for them to do it effectively. And but they're they're trying. And the bugs have a little bit of a problem trying to overwinter here in Florida. But anyway, uh, it's it's something that we really need to be very concerned about. Bringing in non-native vegetation can be des 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 uh, just decimate these areas. Uh, now I'm going to show a, and when when I walk around my yard, uh, I can take my camera. I have a close-up camera. I can walk around my yard, and it just it presents to me just a really exciting opportunity. I don't have to go miles to anywhere. I can do it in my own yard. I have one sixth of an acre. Okay, that's not very much land, but I can go around. And I can take pictures. This is a uh, this is a called a, this particular plant is a frost weed, um, and we have uh, caterpillars. This is a monarch caterpillar, and, uh, and and this particular caterpillar is for the Gulf fruit oil, and this is a this particular plant uh, is one of their host plants, and it is a resurrect. I mean a a uh, quirky stem. It's called a corky stem, and it has a flower that looks very small. It's not at all like the, the one that is, has a bigger flower called a maypop. Uh, it has a much larger flower. It's much more colorful, but this is a much more effective plant. And, and, and the bees, this is a blazing star here. Uh, I'm going to go fairly quickly through these. Uh, the, this is actually a coffee plant back here, a wild coffee plant, and, and this is a, um, a um, Cleopatra monarch, on a, on again, on a yopon. And a yopon is an interesting plant. It, it's, it's very much a native. There are like five varieties of it. They're actually hollies. And, and it, these leaves here have caffeine, and, and, and they make good tea, excellent tea. It's one of the few plants in the world that has a really excellent uh, trees that have excellent tea making leaves. Uh, the Indians used to use it a lot. Um, Guffer Larry, uh, you just, I just sit down and if you just sit down in one, one place, they come to you. You know, it's amazing. Um, this is a blanket flower. I took this picture actually with a cell phone. Um, and this this plant right here is, is one of my favorite plants. It only grows like three or four inches tall. It's very tiny and it's, it has a lot of different common names. Uh, turkey tangle is one. Uh, frog fruit is another. Um, but it is about the size of a match head. But it's very, very attractive to butterflies and bees. And this is another one of the native bees. Um, and of course, we have a lot of these are, this is one of my nesting boxes here. The pair is getting ready to go in. They, when they come, they always land on top or somewhere nearby and show off their, their findings there. Uh, but we have a lot of wildlife here. And uh, um, again, this is a frost weed. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not good at taking a lot of really high powered telephoto stuff. So I have to, and I, but I, that's why I love, this is a milkweed. This is called swamp milkweed. Uh, it's growing in my backyard. This is what it looks like before the worms come. And then they will lay it completely bare. Uh, again, we have monarch here eating. They'll eat everything here down to the ground, but that's good. And the thing is, that if you don't, if you do not have small creatures eating on your landscape, it's not part of our ecosystem. Keep that in mind. Okay, very important concept. Um, now, a couple of months ago, or a few months ago, I was awarded the Waterwise uh, for my yard, and I was sort of surprised. This is a county commissioner here, Ron Moore, for Pasco County. And, and this is a yopon tree that we're under here. This is a weeping yopon. They have the yopon tree comes in three varieties. One is a weeping, a standard, and a uh, a dwarf, which is sometimes called a shilling's holly. But anyway, um, so they came and they gave me this award. 
So I thought I'd take a moment to show you what my yard looks like now and what it looked like when I moved here. Now, there's nothing native here at all. You see the green palms from Brazil? Uh, this is an oak tree. This is native, okay. Um, but these palms are native to Africa. Um, they're, they're actually called Robolini. And I forget what these things were here, but there was nothing native here. And I replaced everything. I took out the queen palms. Uh, this is the weeping yopon. I love this tree. It is great for small spaces. Notice how the limbs hang down uh, and you know, it doesn't go way out. Um, and, and these are all, everything that you see here is native. And I can tell you, I can go down the line and tell you which ones they are, but I don't think we have time for all of that. Um, this is what my yard looked like. This is us leaving after we first bought the house. And you, you see the Robolinis here uh, are, I mean, they're valuable, but, but everybody in the neighborhood's got them. And, and they, they're small, and they're dwarf palms. Uh, there are the, the, um, the family of Carianthus. I mean, um, the, uh, and well, this is what it is now. See the difference here. Let me go back in a moment, see if I can go back. Yeah, another queen palm here. You know, when, when I re-landscaped this area, I found seeds all in the soil from this tree that were sitting there for years and never been eaten by anything. It's incredible. But uh, the, these Robolinis are, are um, the, there's a family of uh, palms that are actually from North Africa. And this is one that they have larger ones too. Uh, that are uh, also the same species, but, but larger trees, um, the developer. This is what I came in now. These are Kuntis here, and Kuntis are wonderful. They're endemic. Um, they're, in fact, the, pres the, the manager of IFAS at the University of Florida was asked what his favorite plant was, and he said it was the Kunti. And the Kunti is an incredible plant in that the Indians would carry it from place to place. And it has a root that looks like a big, huge turnip. And they can plant it and it will grow again. And the, the root can actually be used for making flour for bread. But it is a very drought tolerant plant. And you don't, you don't need to prune it. When I was with the county, uh, I actually recommended and they used it at a lot of fire stations and so forth because they don't need to do a lot of pruning to this thing. You plant it and you forget it for a couple of years and then all the leaves fall off and new ones come on. And that's wonderful. Now, obscured here is a needle palm uh, and there are a few other things here. Uh, this is a, uh, over, over here, this is another, another Kunti. And then here we have a, a um, well, this is a better view here. And that's the sign I just showed you uh, these are native sword ferns here. And uh, this is the needle palm in the back, which is a little bit obscured by, by the image there. And uh, so anyway, that's my yard. Uh, and uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about our habitats here. For thousands of years, we were under sea. This, where do you think this picture was taken? Was it near the beach? Well, it actually was near the beach at one time. Uh, this is a review area and bomboyette scrub. And, and the scrub is a, is a term used for describing very dry areas. And the sand here is very sandy, just exactly the same that you would find going to Clearwater Beach or something like that. But there are a number of different habitats that we have. This is Cypress. Uh, Cypress Swamp. We have a lot of it at Lettuce Lake, but I have a lot of it right here. I live on the Cypress Creek Preserve. This picture I took over here in the preserve. Um, there are wetlands and only certain types of plants grow there, obviously. Uh, and then we have the riverine. This was taken at Lettuce Lake Park. Riverine wetland is a little different in that it, the water is flowing here a little bit more. And, uh, and you see the type of vegetation that you have here. Uh, and then you have wetland marshes. Uh, this was taken on, on the, actually one of, of Swift properties uh, 
and uh, and you have ponds, but marsh type vegetation here, uh, and and they serve a lot of good purpose for wildlife. Upland oak forest. Uh, this is at Lettuce Lake Park on our nature trail, um, and uh, people, humans especially, like the shade provided by oak trees. Now this is pine flatwood. The reason I'm sharing it with you is because pine flatwoods are getting very, very rare. This is a site that actually was managed by the, by the forest, the state of Florida Forest Service. It's one of their, their tracts of land. It, uh, it has been maintained with regular fires. And what happens is that you get all the regular vegetation down here is much lower because it's been burned on a regular basis. You get the trees. And what's, what's really nice is that the sunlight gets to the ground. It grows wildflowers. It allows for animals and so forth to eat the vegetation down here. Birds place to, church, to perch and make net, build nests, especially large birds like eagles and, and raptors and so forth. So there's only of all in Florida, of all of the pine woods in Florida, only 3% remain today. And that's incredible. And it really, it's, 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 it's very difficult. Uh, sand hills, sand hills are very much the same in many ways, but they're well drained and they are sometimes quite dry. See the soils here. Uh, and, and this is in the Cypress Creek Preserve, which I ride my bicycle there, I volunteer over there. And uh, it, you have a lot of openness uh, and Again, that's Sand Hill. Sand Hill is one of the areas that developers salivate over. They would love to go in there and build houses. And the reason is, is because the drainage is already minimal. It is well drained already. So that's what they like. That's the most endangered properties, lands that we have in Hillsborough, in, in, in Central Florida. Scrubs are the very driest. And we talked a little bit about scrubs before. But I wanted to show you, you see very few large trees and very few trees can manage to grow in soils that are this sandy. But you do get a lot of ground vegetation. There are a lot of interesting things there, but they are the single driest and they're also probably the rarest of all habitats that we have here in Florida, and especially in Florida County. And uh, uh, so, you know, the, the ast Florida asters, for example, was one of the tree or the plants that were very endangered. This is the type of area you would find Florida asters growing. Now, there's also a coastal. We don't have coastal necessarily in Hillsborough County, but I include it. And what's important about this is that the plants that grow here have two characteristics. One is, and this is where you get into practical application. My background originally was engineering and I always like to have a practical application for things. And the practical application here is that these plants will grow in hot, dry, sandy soil. And they will also grow in areas that you have a very high alkalinity due to the fact there's a lot of shell in the soil. Now, traffic medians, roadway medians, very often are, are filled with lime rock. They're in hot, dry areas. The roads are very hot because the asphalt heat, cars going by. So when I went to the city of Tampa, one of the things I did was I changed down a lot of the plants they were planting. They were planting stuff like azaleas and things of that sort. But the plants that you find growing here are the type of plants that you want to plant in hot, dry areas. So the kunti is one, the yopons are another, uh, and, and of course, a lot of the grasses and muley grasses and so forth that are growing here make ideal plants. And when I changed over, and I had a lot of flack when I first started doing that, uh, but people started to realize, wow, this is, a, this is pretty good because it, our maintenance was less and so forth. So that was a very consider, a con concern. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't take up too much time, but I gave some time here for questions. Okay, um, we do have some questions and comments. Um, so Sandy asks, do you have any recommendations for turf? 
Are perennial peanuts native? Have you used it or mimosa for turf? Well, there are a couple of things here. Sunshine mimosa is the one I think they're talking about. And I don't use it because it has, um, it, it's, it can be very difficult to walk on. It's got, it's got thorns and so forth. And it's an okay plant. But let me, let me go back. I'm gonna see if I can uh, go back for a moment. And I wanna show you something um, wherever I was. Um, um, I apologize, Joel. I, I thought you were done and there was a blank spot there. So I stopped your presentation. So you'll, you'll need to do share screen again. Yeah, okay, um, share. Uh, what, what I wanna do here is I wanna run through and I wanna show you something. Um, see if I can get to it here. find it. Move all the way down. Um, this is my house. Uh, let's see if it's better. See this grass here? This is St. Augustine grass. It's not been fertilized probably five years. Uh, I have people walking down my street all the time because we live in a little loop area. People like to walk on the loop. And they look at my yard and they say, wow, you've got the greenest grass in the whole neighborhood. Well, it hasn't been fertilized. It has, it's never been pesticided. Um, it's got natural bugs that are nutrifying uh, the, the ground, the soil. Um, it's very important to keep that habitat going, that, the ecology of that habitat going. Now, I have an irrigation system that was here when I moved in and I still maintain it. But normally I don't irrigate my grass until it absolutely needs it. And normally that would be two to four times a year. I don't, don't irrigate it on a regular basis. There is an oak tree here that provides some degree of shade, but that is St. Augustine grass. Now that to me, it's, if you look at it carefully and you get right down to it, it's not just St. Augustine grass. It's got a lot of other stuff in there. There's a little bit of uh, sedges and a little bit of this and that and the other, but they're okay. I mean, really, they all work together. And, uh, and I, I, I love it. I mean, to me, I just, I don't have to worry about it. And, uh, and, and that's what, that's what management does for you. Now, you mentioned uh, peanut, peanut. I tried that when I was with the city of Tampa um, and I did not have a lot of success with it. It's nice in some areas. It depends on the soil, I think but it is not a native and, and I, I would not want to have it in my entire yard. If I had a smaller area, I might consider trying it. And the other thing to keep in mind is that my yard has a number of different habitats. The upper portion of my yard, and I don't know if let's see if it shows up in the next image. Um, I guess not. But anyway, uh, it, this, this area here is quite dry. This is a relatively high, dry area. We have a pond in the back, which is much lower, and this area becomes drained toward the pond. But as you move further down toward my backyard, you get into much different soils. They're much richer and the darker soils, and they're, they're more moisture related. But you can only grow certain things in this area that are well adapted to, to, to high, dry soils. And, and that's a good thing to keep in mind. That's why I show the images of the different habitats and why certain plants are, are more adapted to one habitat or the other. And that's a important. Cotis, for example, like high and dry. Uh, the, a lot of the grasses and so forth that you see over here, this is mealy grass over here, they are high and dry. This, this weeping oak pine is a vegetation that you find growing on the coastal areas. Um, and uh, it, it likes dry soil because it, it's adapted to high sandy soil. So anyway, that, that's an important consideration. Okay. Um, so Barbara wanted a clarification on one of the native plants you keep talking about, and that's the Kunti. 
And that is spelled, well, Sandy spelled it out for C-O-O-N-T-I-E, coon tea. And right. that is a native plant. It definitely is a native plant. And it's one of the slowest native plants uh, or plants that you'll ever find. It takes a plant this size will probably take five years at minimum to get that big. Uh, and uh, they have orange seed. I had some people, there was a group of people uh, that lived in a house. Uh, they, they actually uh, took out all of their, their coonties because they said that they, the animals, they were, had dogs. Uh, they were afraid they would eat the seeds and the seeds are poisonous. Well, a lot of plants have poisonous seeds, but all you have to do is to cut the seed pods off. It comes in a cone. The seeds are in a cone. You snip the cones off, put them in the garbage, you're done. You don't have to worry about animals eating them, but uh, squirrels eat them and they don't seem to, to die. So anyway, they're, they're really good plants. When I auction, I do a plant auction at our Native Plant Society and I belong to two different chapters, the Pasco chapter and the Hillsborough chapter. So one of the things I do is I auction the plants off and as I auction them, I talk a little bit about each plant. And what I say about the Kunti when people bring one in to auction off is I look at this little pot and I'll say, well, this is three years old. Well, actually it's a bit of an exaggeration, but they're very slow growing, which in many ways at first seems like bad, but it's good in a long way because you don't, I don't want, this plant has never been pruned, never been pruned. It just grows so high and stops just leans over and the, the limbs just lean over. And this, this little palm here is adapted to, it's a very tiny little palm. It's called a needle palm. And the reason I planted it here is because this plant is almost 10 years old and look how tall it is. It doesn't grow tall, but it, it will eventually get a, a little bit higher. But yeah, I didn't want anything obscuring all of this area here. So anyway, and, and this here is a, a, a plant that does grow taller. It's, it's called rosin weed, which is a great plant for, for yellow flowers. And it's in the back because it tends to pop up and that's where that is. So you have to layer things according to the size and so forth. Next question. Okay. Um, next question is from um, Val. She says, oaks are being planted on highway medians. Is this a good idea? Well, yeah, oaks, and, and here again, there are 19 or 20 oaks that are native to Florida. And when I was with the city of Tampa, we had a serious problem because I was in charge of forestry, among other things. And the trees that were planted uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago at that time uh, were all dying. And, and the reason is because laurel, they use laurel oaks which is probably one of the most common oak trees we have here. And unfortunately, they are not very, they're very inferior oaks. And they have a short lifespan. They have a tendency for uh, all kinds of problems. They do not heal themselves well. They, they get rot, for example, in their, in their limbs when the limbs break or are pruned. They get mistletoe. They get uh, Spanish moss. Uh, they get a lot of things that are really bad for them. Well, live oaks will last probably 400, 450 years, they're much stronger. They don't get mistletoe, they heal themselves better. Uh, and so really, and they're slower growing, they're a better tree. And planting them along the roadways, you need to allow enough room, of course, uh, and need to be further back. Mine, uh, if, I don't know if you can see it or not, but, but I don't know if I can shift over this whole image here, but maybe I can, I don't know. Okay, well, oh, it's over here. You see the limb from my oak tree is over here. Um, and um, that, uh, that, that's a good, a good tree, actually. And what it does, it provides uh, shade. It provides leaves that fall down in the wintertime. And those leaves uh, rot and become nutrients in the soil. And it, it's a cycle here between the grass and the, and the oak tree to provide the shade, the nutrients, and so forth. And that's one reason why my lawn doesn't need any attention except to mow it occasionally. I mow it at four inches uh, and it looks great. And, and that's because of it's managed in a, in a cycle with the tree. Great. Okay. Um, Michael asks, how do we find out what are native and non-native plants? And then I would like to add to that, um, 
what's the difference between Florida friendly and a native plant? Okay, let me start with Florida friendly. I was on a, I was on the Green Industry Advisory Committee with our water management district, Swiftmine, for about 10 years. And they pushed Florida friendly. And, and in fact, uh, they even had a brochure that had a lot of Florida friendly plants. The original reason that the term came up was that the water management district was concerned about water management. And the fact is that about 40% of all of the fresh water used in our water systems goes into the ground, into grass, into lawns, and so forth. So they were concerned about that, and I rightly so. But because a plant is, requires a little bit of water, it was considered a Florida-friendly plant. Well, native is different. Uh, it can be Florida-friendly, but it can also be native, which is a very important concept. And there are a lot of things, a lot of websites, uh, there, the Florida Native Plant Society website uh, has a really good uh, website. Uh, our, our native chapters, both the Hillsborough and the Pasco chapter have really good websites that list different plants in different types of areas and so forth. And that's a very good place to go. There are not that many native nurseries around. There's a nursery or a plant sale we had at USF occasionally. Uh, I was the chairman of the advisory committee at USF for about uh, eight or nine years. Uh, we had uh, uh, festivals there where we would have plants for sale and we would, the Native Plant Society would have a booth there and sell them. Uh, but unfortunately, and, you know, the interesting thing is, and I'm gonna say this and it may, I don't wanna ruffle any feathers here, but uh, when I was with Hillsborough County, uh, the county administrator got a letter from the Hillsborough County Nurserymen's Association, and they said that this guy, Joel Jackson, should be fired because he supports only using native plants, and he's not supporting our industry. Well, you know, that's their point of view. And we went to, the, the county administrator said, you guys need to get together. You need to go to lunch and mend some fences here. So I went to lunch with a fellow, and we were sitting there at lunch talking, and he said to me, can you give me one good reason why we should have or be supporting native plants? And I said, yes, it's the wildlife. It's the link with wildlife. And he looked at me like he was shocked. And he said, no one has ever been able to tell me that. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that. Well, a couple of weeks later, he called me up and he says, I want to get more information on native plants. I want to come to your yard. I want to see what's going on over there. And he did, and he regularly sent somebody by and I would give him starts for coonties and for other things that I had seedlings popping up in my yard. And we became very good friends as a result of that. But it was because of education. It was because of enlightening. And that's why I was so motivated to do the signs and why I go to garden clubs and so forth. When I go to garden clubs, what I do is I have a list of 38 plants that are good for Hillsborough County. And I call them good plants for Central Florida. And there's a list of them. And then I do a slide presentation and I go right down the list and talk about every single plant on that list and, and what it looks like and how good it is or bad or whatever. And, uh, and, and that's important. It's hard to get the word out. Uh, the, inter the internet is a good place to start. There are a lot of good books around on native plants. I've seen a lot of them at the, at the, the plant store and the bookstores and bookshops and so forth. But that's how I learned a lot about these things. It's not like, uh, honestly, uh, I don't know of a course someplace. They don't teach a lot of these things. Uh, even, even master gardeners sometimes don't really get as much as they should, I think, in this regard. So it's, it's an uphill battle, but it is worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other question about that? Or? I think, uh, Sandy, do you have a comment on, along this topic? Unmute yourself if you do and comment. Oh, I, I just wanted to say that on the Christmas bird count, we were counting over in Fishhawk and they had all these beautiful beauty berry plants that were, were just perfect. You know, their leaves were perfect. They were loaded with berries and and, and I was just astonished at how perfect all their landscaping was, but not one berry had been touched. 
whereas the ones I have at home had been practically stripped bare of berries at that time. And I, I don't know, I just uh, do my best to try to talk people out of spraying their yards to death, you know, I mean, but, but people just can't get over the, you know, the, the bugs eating holes in their plants, you know, it's just a different way of, of, of thinking and, and it's hard to convert people from that, you know? <laughs> it, it is hard. And so that was, just a, that was just a comment I had that my plants were stripped bare and the ones at Fishhawk, although beautiful, you know, were just laden with berries and, the, and there were no birds or nothing on them, you know? That's why I struggle so much to try to get the word out. Uh, and, and I, you know, I just wish that there were other opportunities more of it, but whether it comes talking to a garden club or, or at a native plant meeting or, or these kinds of meetings that you want to do or whatever it takes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be there to try to help. And I made these signs up and I made actually uh, close to a hundred signs and I've shared them with other counties. I mean, Pinellas County, Paso County and so forth. And I would like for other counties or other places to use them to help educate the public. And, uh, uh, and, and that, there was a lot of work. I mean, I spent like two hours on every one of those signs and, and it, it, on average, and I made over, a, I made a, a, about a hundred of them. So you can imagine the hours I spent, but it's very important uh, to me to try to get the word out. Can I just say one more thing? Um, it's like I had asked my son who was, you know, having his, just an insect uh, spraying program at his house. You know, they come in, they treat the inside of the house, but then part of their program is to, they go around the outside of your house and spray all the foundation plants. So I, I, I finally talked him into at least not doing that. Um, you know, and it's something I, I don't know that people think about when they have pest control come to their house. Um, you know, that they're also doing a lot of uh, spraying of plants on the on the outside. So even if you haven't hired them for lawn control uh, or lawn pest control, your, your uh, you know, the, the pesticide control for your house is also uh, often spraying the outside. So I'll, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. You know, you know, one of the things is that if you have a spot that's got a problem, treat the spot, not the whole lawn. And, and that way uh, things will return and, and heal themselves. And that's a very important, I, this neighbor of mine, I was over there, I went over there the other day to visit with the bluebird nesting box that I gave her. And I was amazed at how damaged and all the, the insects or the uh, chinch bugs that were in her lawn. And here she had been spraying it regularly, regularly, regularly. And, it, and all it was doing was setting it up for more, more infestations. So it was, it's a shame. I mean, I mean, she takes a lot of pride in her grass and she's always over here asking, well, how in the world are you doing this? And I tell people, and I don't think they really believe me. They just go off and do their own thing, uh, you know. So. Okay, well, we need to move on because we have several more comments, but um, definitely great information. Um, Janice says, Joel, we are so lucky to be the beneficiaries of your fine work. Many thanks. And that's tr true. Joel is leaving a wonderful legacy to the future residents and current residents of Hillsborough County. Um, Stephen um, asks or states, many people believe trees are dangerous. Are they dangerous in a yard? I'm not sure I know what, what he's referring to. Do well, you know, Joel? I can comment on that. What, I get I, I get can, a lot of people in my neighborhood who who we just we we've got like we're inundated with tree companies coming in and cutting down trees. I I think it's abhorrent, but I talk to people and they say, oh, it's dangerous. We need to get rid of these dangerous trees. Well, you know the, the tree the tree companies they're looking for business. You know, and one of the things is that when I was in charge of grounds maintenance for the city of Tampa, I used to go to all these conferences all over the place, all over the country. And, and I would listen to different presentations. And one of the things was a lot of lawn care people would come in and, and tree, tree trimming people would come in and they say, oh, we need to prune these, these uh, cabbage palms 
or these palm trees back to make them a hurricane cut because if a storm comes. That's a lot of nonsense. Uh, the, the University of Florida did a study after Andrew. They found out that the cabbage palm was the most durable tree in, in Hurricane uh, Andrew, even though it had a lot of farms on it. And to prune the tree is pointless. All it does is destroys bat habitat and, and bird habitat. It gets rid of a lot of the seed bearing capacity of the tree and it damages the tree in the long run. And, and the reason is because they would say, they were honest about it. Well, you know, in the winter time, we're not mowing the grass, so let's get out and prune trees. And in other words, we're moving Spanish moss. That is vermilion. Spanish moss is actually vermilion. It does not injure the tree. It's an air plant. You do not need to remove it. No way, no how. Um, so there's a lot of, of un unfortunate. And the other thing is, there are some trees that are dangerous. And, and for that, you want to keep certain things away. And that's one reason why you keep oak trees away, probably 30 or 40 feet of the minimum from a, tr uh, a house, a foundation. Their roots can be very difficult uh, on, on if it's too close. You don't want the tree really too close. And the other thing is there are some limbs due to pro improper pruning. And I had a I had a, a, a tree right across the street from me, an oak tree. It was actually two separate oak trees growing together. And after a while, one of the trees blew over because the other one, they forced each other apart and one of the limbs, the whole tree fell over and left one whole side of it completely bare. But there are a lot of things that, that do require pruning, but there's also a lot of more, a, a lot of unfortunate aggressiveness when it comes to profit motive. Okay, that, yeah, that explains it. And I've heard that too, even on the news, they're saying to do that. Um, we've got some nice comments from Sue and from Sandy, thanking Joel for all of his work in Hillsborough County. Um, I'm gonna move on to the questions here since we're running out of time. Um, so Val asks, um, she says, I heard the golden oaks were extinct. Is that so? Never heard of a golden oak. I haven't either. That's another, Joel and I were talking before class about common names and how different places they mean different things. Um, Sharon asks, have you ever presented to a commercial landscaping company? No. That's a shame. <laughs> and, uh, Trudy asks if you can share your list of 38 plants. Well, the only way I can do that is to um, have a have them send me an email and I will send them a copy of it. I well, like send it to me, Joel. You have my email address and I will uh, send it to her. I can send it to everybody if everyone would like it. That's fine. Okay, great. And uh, Janet asks, when you say you water your St. Augustine grass two to four times a year, do you mean two to four periods of time or really two to four days? Times. Times. I, I have a soil probe, uh, which you poke into the ground and you measure the soil depth to probably eight inches. And you can tell if it's starting to get dry. You can also tell by the leaves starting to fold a little bit and turn gray. And those are the times, to me, and, and when, again, when I was with the city of Tampa, I was the ground manager for five years. I had a lot of irrigation equipment. I, you know, in Bayshore Boulevard, for example, was one of the areas with irrigation. I had a lot of stuff going on. And I would tell salesmen, irrigation salesmen, I'm here to keep the grass surviving, not to make it so lush and beautiful. Okay, survival is very important to me. I don't want to overdo it. And, and if, it, if I get the grass to survive, that's fine. It may look a little peaked sometimes, that's okay. But if it's alive, it's going to be good. And here in Florida, we get almost 52 inches of rain a year. And, and that's a lot of rain. Now, granted, we have a drought at the, in October, November, and again in May and April. So that, that's, you know, that's important. But, and, and that's the only time, that you should, and I never, ever, even though my irrigation system has a time clock, I never turn that time clock on. I push the button manually to start it and stop it. And, and that's important as to how I approach my yard. Okay. Um, who, um, 
whoever just sent a message to me that you would like the list also, you're showing up as iPhone, so I don't know who you are. So if you could just type in your name for me, I would appreciate that. Uh -huh. um, Val, Val have, also, I'm sorry, Joel. I have an email address uh, for, for uh, Tampa Audubon. It's well, I, I, I may just send out to all of the students your list. I'll just do that so everybody gets a copy. Yeah, and they'll have it for the future. Um, Val asks, what trees are best for keeping our water filtered and clean? And we need to move pretty quickly because I don't know if um, Al has another class because it's uh, I have two minutes after 12, but. No, no, we're, we're okay. Go ahead. I don't have another class today. Okay, thank you, Al. So go ahead, Joel. <laughs> well, I mean, all trees uh, filter water, grasses filter water. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it is not like one or the other. Uh, so it's kind of hard to answer. I talked a little bit in my presentation, Joel, um, about how some, some plants like um, pickerel weed and um, Sagittaria seem to be especially efficient to, you know, Break okay, down oils and greases. So, yeah, of course. Um, pickle, yeah, that's yes. Pickle weed, uh, Sagittarius, excellent. I have pictures of them, but I didn't include those because I was concerned about my backyard has a whole area there planted with aquatic plants. I don't want to get into that because I was afraid that a lot of people did not have that kind of yard. So, I don't want to start talking about that. Anyway, but that's true. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, that is the. Um, the last of our comments, I believe. And thank you, Joel, for such a great, two great presentations today. And um, again, thanks to all our participants and attendees. We've um, enjoyed in give, presenting this Natural Hillsboro class. And I imagine we'll be back next year again. Uh, watch the Tampa Audubon website um, for information and how to connect with us. And I will send out Joel's list and maybe some of the um, fine photographs that Mike Hayes has taken at Lettuce Lake Park. So thank you, everyone. And thanks for hanging in with us for, for um, a real treat today to hear two programs from Joel. Thank you, Joel. Well, thank you for helping. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Good seeing you all. Thank you.